It's going to take a second here. <clears throat> Okay, we're set. Alejandro, how's it? How are you doing this morning? Doing great. I'm excited to uh, start things off with you. Awesome. I am too. Um, so, Alejandro, maybe we could just talk about um, kind of go through a couple of the some of the questions that we started with and thinking about voice. How does that sound to you? Sure. Sounds good um okay, let me get this up so i i think it kind of started to alejandro and i um you know over the years have you know phone calls about teaching or planning things and it feels like we've we've talked voice has ended up being there's you know a few things that we end up talking about and voice is one of them and I also know that, and this is again, part of the question, you know, that we're discussing, but a lot of the work that you're making, you're translating and writing feels what, what one might call voice driven. Um, so it feels, it feels right for us to be talking about voice. And I love thinking about it myself. Um, some of the questions that Alejandro and I <clears throat> started with, um, how does voice show up in writing? I mean, another like question that just immediately came to me, what is, when we say voice, what are we, what are we talking about? Right. And how does that, what we're talking about, how does that show up in writing? Are we writing for the page or for the ear? And perhaps we might think of it as writing for the ear on the page, question mark. Um, Alejandro, you mentioned this in a phone call we had as we kind of switch between sound and writing. I think that's what you said. What tools do we have on the page within and beyond language to show language's responsiveness to the spoken? And why do we want to get voice right as writers? And how, what does that mean um, for generating the work, for revising the work? Um, are there any other questions that are occurring to you now? Alejandro? No, I think that that's a good set to start with. I'll, I'll just make a couple remarks. First, just a, a housekeeping thing, um, especially for the new people. Um, feel free to, uh, drop comments and questions in the chat. We may not be able to, you know, follow, <laughs> in real time, but all of this will be helpful when, uh, you know, since we encourage people to, uh, uh, pick up discussion in workshop. So, um, this is a good way to kind of keep up with what's going on and, and record your thoughts in real time. Um, I think that the... The way I was thinking about it this morning, we didn't really talk about this, right? But but um, I think that maybe the most general thing one can say when one's talking about a writer or a particular text by a writer is that the text has a style, one or more styles. And then we, you know, we think of at least the writers that are most interesting as having a particular style. And so what I was thinking about is that um, when we try to look into style and ask, ask ourselves sort of what makes a style, one of the one of the key components could be voice, the way that, that voice appears or is deployed in that style. And what I what I like about this notion, at least as, as our conversations uh, um, developed, is that we have a, a, a you could say a kind of continuum from um, something that is a, you could say a, a, a practical or almost procedural problem for the writer, which is how how does how does how do different voices appear? So to take some examples, 
if you if you have a, a work of fiction or work of nonfiction uh, in which in which there's recorded dialogue, there's there's simply straightforwardly that question of how do the different voices manifest and how how do those different forms of expression become part of a larger style? And that's I think the more kind of concrete practical end of the continuum. Then there's a there's a another end which. Now that I said concrete, I'm kind of committing myself to call abstract, but I don't know if it really is. It's maybe a different kind of concreteness, which has to do with, yeah, this question about um, the the way in which uh, um, the the written text is sort of destined to be spoken or to be read out loud, to be performed. Yeah or at least it always has that potentiality in it. And so here we're not just thinking about the instances where straightforwardly, you know, in a poem, someone is speaking or in a story, someone is speaking, we have something like dialogue or reported speech, but that anything written has as one of its possibilities that it will be said out loud. And so every every written text is, is, is potentially a, a, the score for a performance, right? And, and so, in that way, it it you know, the writing anticipates anticipates the voice that will read it. And um, I think that the questions we came up with, so to repeat them, how does voice show up in writing would be the the broadest one, right? Are we writing for the page or for the ear? And perhaps we might think of it as writing for the ear on the page, right? That notion of the ear there is is the anticipation of being said out loud, and of course, in a you know, in an ordinary practical way, I tend to give students. I always give students this advice that don't forget to read what you're writing out loud as part of the process of of composition and revision, but also just of sharing. I think that you know, for me at least, when I'm working on something, um, and I know it's ready to share, that's identical with. Uh, with knowing that I want to read it to somebody. Mm -hmm. those, those things are the same. Or another variant that I like is having someone read my own writing back to me and being able to hear it in their voice. So let me uh, flip it back to you there, Jay. Those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I, you know, I think picking up on that last notion um just that like the the idea that you might um learn something about your writing um um think about it in terms of what might be added or subtracted by hearing somebody else read it aloud by hearing another voice um carry the work is um maybe something I can kind of um, respond to with just, just sort of thinking about how I've, I've thought about voice um, over the years. Um, and this is also something that my, one of my mentor teachers, um, when I was in MFA school, um, talked about. Um, but the, the notion that voice has a lot of um, qualities of, of um, like there's vocal qualities and that those are distinct to the speaker and that there's kind of a, essentially a range, there's a variety of vocal qualities. So that might include, I just need to go to some of my notes here. Um, Yeah, um, so we might be talking about feeling, feelings, moods, um, you, you know, like, um, you, you know, a voice might, you know, might be um, quiet, a voice might be um, crowded, a voice might be, um, fragmented. Um, I'm thinking also about rhetorical stances. 
So the voice that is self-reflexive, the voice that listens to itself and responds, um, you know, almost the voice, and we're going to look at some examples where this happens, but the voice that interrupts itself, the, the sort of interrupting voice, the digressive voice, those sort of show up, I think, in kind of syntax um, often or manifest in syntax. Um, also inflection, um, the, the, sound, the sound of a voice, which can, I think, be um, expressed, you know, through through syntax, through diction, through the sounds of the words, the sonic qualities. Um, I think about Mary Rufel. She talks about, you know, there being poets who work above the din and below the din, which I think is a kind of like she. I think she's referring to inflection. Um, or just even like, um, like um, you know, cultural and ancestral influences that might be streaming through a voice. And I'm thinking about James Baldwin's kind of sermon-like, you know, fibrility of, of his prose. Um, the more recently, Roger Reeves, I think, has that same sort of quality, a kind of expansion and fever um very above the din um you know there's rhythms i think rhythm the pro the rhythm of the prose is sort of somehow impacting the voice um there's sort of like psychological affects like flatness or curtness or um you know reticence um which is also kind of close to feeling um one of the things that one of my mentors said to me, and this may be a good way to get into the Notley thing, but he sort of thought about voice, and I'm curious to what you what you think about this. I don't know if we talked about this, Alejandro, but he kind of used the metaphor of the river and the stream. And that voice is the stream and all of these things are streaming through it. You know, there's there's creatures streaming through it there's sediment, there's, you know, all sorts of, you know, branches that are down, um, uh, you know, bacteria, everything's just kind of streaming through and it's always changing. And, um, you know, like, or you think about regional, like dialects or different kinds of lexicons, like, like the way that we might have work language that sort of streams through voice um, so I, there's just like all these different, um, ways or components that might stream through that single voice. And when I'm reading a work that's really voice driven, I'm thinking a lot about the complexity where I'm seeing the contradictions and the fullness of that voice, the modulation um, knowing that actually a voice can be quiet and, you know, can be below the din and above the din. It can include um, a kind of circumnavigation, and it also can be very direct and frank. Um, and that's part of the stream. The stream is always changing and it's rich and it's sort of even what might seem contradictory is sort of working in in concert with with each other. Um I guess, well, you can take it either way, but I, I do, I'll throw a question out and you don't have to answer it. But I do wonder when you are making translations or making the novel that you're making and you, I feel you working through voice when I hear that work. Um, how is it that you're, like when you're revising it, when you're reading it aloud, and listening to it, or if you're hearing somebody else listen to it, what are you, what are you listening for? If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, I, I guess maybe two things. Um, one is that in a, in a, in a way that's hard to describe the ear can pick up on, on things that are wrong. <laughs> 
Uh, right. So that's that's not necessarily the most interesting part, but it's very practical. Um, it, you you can hear you you can uh, as you read you pick up a certain rhythm, and you can very easily hear when something falls out of that. Um, at another level, um, you know, there's a there's a story that uh, Max Broad tells about uh, Kafka reading the trial out loud to to his friends and laughing so hard he falls out of his chair. And that that always struck me because uh, because Kafka in general and especially that novel, the trial is described as being very somber and depressing and, and and so the the idea that um you know why would he have started laughing even at his at his own writing right and and and, and sort of cracked himself up and it it it, it shows that there, there's obviously i mean if you read it and and i i had read it before generally taken it to be a pretty dark novel um and i started i i after reading that anecdote i reread it and and I started noticing that there's all there's all this stuff that that's going on. Um, maybe a way to describe it is that a lot of the action in the novel um, looks like uh, uh, when when you try to just picture what's being described, it's like a Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton thing. There's a lot of people kind of bustling together, moving furniture around, stumbling, knocking each other. There's a lot of this kind of slapstick action. That you might miss if 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 you have it in your head that this is this this is all you know this kind of dark existentialist thing, um, and so in a sense, it, it's partly you know whatever that anecdote tells is is what I try to trigger in myself, you know if I can make myself laugh or if I can if I can discover other things along those lines um, to be to be surprised by what I wrote. You know, so like I said, I mean, the, the sense that something is wrong is is useful, but it's but there's something there's something more profound, which is just to hear what it what it does. And, you know, for me, reading out loud is very is very important. It is sometimes the whole destiny of something is just to get read out loud. Um, that is, I, you know, I think of that as as publication and and uh, and and to to, to to have something printed is 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 another kind of publication, but but I don't necessarily think it's superior. Um, I think they're they're variants. It's uh, different kinds of audiences are reached. Um, let's see. I think I answered. I started to answer yeah. the question. the The other one, you know, just more straightforwardly from the point of view of translation, and I think we're going to talk mm -hmm. about one specific example here in a minute. But um, one problem you know common problem with translation is that uh a translator uh, some translators uh, are so concerned to have fidelity to the the meaning of of the source text the original that they they produce something that we we jokingly call translation ease where you get something that's not it's not very successful english it's a kind of it's more like a kind of map or outline of what's happening in the other language, but it doesn't really succeed in the target language and in, in the one you're translating into. And so the test is always reading out loud. The test is, is this going to be a good English poem or is this going to be good English prose? Um, and you have to sort of test it uh, in a space that's that's separate from from the space of translation, I guess, or it's is a kind of separate region. And, and for me, the the test is always well. I I can get very in my head thinking in Spanish and then in English and then in Spanish and then in English and doing that work. But then when I uh, take the take the the draft and I read it to someone who has no connection to the Spanish, I through their response and through whatever happens to me when I'm in that relationship. I, I kind of experience it as an English text, right? And so there, there, there's something that I, I need. I need that other person's ear and the rest of their responses to be able to do for myself. So, um, yeah, that's that's another way of thinking about it.
Yeah, it's interesting the the reading aloud part or the bringing in the other reader or imagined reader somehow raises up what you've been calling the say <clears throat> excuse me the sayable. Mm -hmm. Like it's sort of it's there all along, but it brings it to uh, um, our consciousness in a different way. Because I think we're paying attention through our ears, which is just probably getting to a more fuller body or somatic experience, just because our sense of sight, sight is so overvalued or often desensitized. Um, yeah, and, and the sayable is also, is also has, it has aesthetic and ethical dimensions, right? There's plenty of things that are, um, they're they're perfectly coherent phrases they're grammatical and so on but i just don't want to write them i don't want to say them i'm not I'm, I'm either just aesthetically disinclined to or in some cases i'm ethically disinclined to i don't it is it's like i don't feel like it right and so you could have uh uh without really thinking about it written something that you don't actually want to say to somebody or you don't want said in in a broader sense um Roz here wrote in the chat, how does re asked, how does reading out loud bring out the subliminal or subconscious context? I think I think that's a way to put it, right? Um, there's a, there there's when you read out loud, you detach a little bit from that. I mean, I think I think dwelling in the in the sort of private, silent inner space and writing is obviously a a, a um a practice we want to dedicate ourselves to but there's also um you can fool yourself in that space right you can fool yourself just as much as you can you can free yourself and so um subliminal is a really interesting way to put it right that that there's there's a way in which you you can you you realize you were saying something that you weren't saying or you realize you were being funny when you were trying to be serious or the other way around um that's you know working with the you know what you could call the big mind right the little mind is the mind that's there concentrating and picking words and 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 phrases and and kind of analytic in that way but there's also you know uh i i think a big mind at work which is not exactly mine or yours and uh it's 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 leaving clues <laughs> which you you have to it may be, maybe the ear is better at picking up you know the same way uh, jay was saying you know we pick up tone of voice or discern something about somebody by their accent or so on um hey can i take a, a little crack at that question um yes. um i first of all i love what you just said about the little mind big mind um and that the big mind is that more collective space, the space, I'm thinking about Cecilia Vicuña right now, who talks about, you know, language not coming necessarily from within us, but actually pouring through us, um, materializing us. And it's like that big mind is getting at that, at that part. Um, I'm going to kind of answer by not answering Roz, um, and say that one of the things I do when I read my work aloud, what I might be really picking up on, and this is where I think it can be helpful to think about your own work as voice, is I am picking up on some of those qualities that I may not necessarily be naming as I'm generating the work. Like I might suddenly realize that, oh, wow, I, I do actually interrupt myself quite a bit. Um, and that shows up in, you know, parenthetical, you know, I'll, I have all these parenthetical clauses or um, I might pick up on certain, you know, certain kinds of words um, that they might come from a certain kind of dialect or lexicon. And so reading it aloud does help me hear some of those qualities that then help me think about revision, because I think you can and I, I'm. I don't know, Alejandro, if this is your sense, but I think we can also, you know, really just have voice in mind as we revise. Um, that everything, 
um, all of the other elements will pour through voice, you know, plot pours through voice or, um, you know, it, you know, just word choice or a proportion that all of those things end up getting, you know, sort of being connected through voice if we're sort of working in that really like sonic, that sort of sonic place. Um, maybe we should go. What do you think, Alejandro, about going to one of our examples? Yeah. So. Um... Has everyone the has the, the handout, right? I'm going to put it in the chat. I got to do that really quick. Okay. So uh, Jay's sharing this handout, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, two books by uh, Joshua Beckman, um, which are just to to put a, a a set of a set of examples in front of us. So one of them is uh, this book, Tomage. Just published by Wave Books. When was this? Wow, twenty one. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, you'll see uh, 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 the first couple pages there in excerpt. So the story of this book is that um, Tomasz Shalomun was a Slovenian poet who um, uh, uh, wrote many many books and and also collaborated. Uh, especially with translators. So he, uh, he, uh, Tomaj had a so-so English, especially at first, and would put his poems into English and then collaborate with younger poets. And um, a good deal, probably at least a half dozen American poets uh, worked with him to create uh, the, the first batch of English translations of his books. There's another more recent batch, which are people working directly from the Slovenian. But one of one of these uh, early collaborators was was Joshua Beckman, and um, uh, uh, sometime I don't quite know when, but a couple years, obviously before this book came out, so probably something like twenty seventeen or eighteen, when Tomaj died, uh, Joshua returned to a series of recorded interviews he had done with with Tomaj, and uh, worked them into the the poem that this book is um so you can let me open the document here to see exactly where it is alejandro do you mind if i share the screen for oh yeah sure yeah while i'm talking yeah. so uh, uh so what i want to point out i mean this is uh what is this where well it has a couple of different things. There are poems by Tomaj in here. Um, and there's also documentation in the way of pictures. But by and large, so this first thing, what Jay is showing now is a, is a poem by Tomaj, which opens the book. So the first thing you read is his, um, his poem. And if you notice the poem that Joshua chose there is a very talky poem, like many of Tomaj's poems. Have you ever seen God how he comes running at 2.30 exactly, responsibility, responsibility, you don't draw me near the beginning or the end, immovable and tied, and so on, right? It's, it's, it's just jumping into this discourse, someone is talking, addressing you directly. Um, and so this now, the next page, if you, yeah, the next page is uh, the beginning of the poem composed by Joshua out of these recordings of Tomaj. So I'm usually somehow shy about reading my young poems because they don't go with this body anymore. It was in 64, so probably I was 23 or maybe 22. I don't remember. No, I started one in 63. So I was 24 or 23. No, no art. I was just a student of art history. Maybe I should start from my youth, from my childhood, if you want. We came to, well, my father was in a way politically punished. We have to leave, we had to leave Ljubljana. Okay, so I, I, we don't need to keep going there. We, you have a nice sample to look at. But just to go back, if you would, Jade, back to the first page, just to think about what, what we have here, right? So imagine the right the source is a, a recording where, where someone has begun speaking about his life. And 
you could take this audio and do lots of things with it, right? If it if you had, you know, the standard form of like a journalistic interview, you would have quotation marks. And even if you kept the exact wording, people would add, you know, you know punctuation and so on. So how is it made into a poem? Well, what I don't see here is any punctuation. The text has been centered. And the really the main tool that that Joshua has used are the line breaks and then the double breaks that make up these little, you could sort of call them stanzas, right? That's a little kind of a stretch to call them stanzas, but the the phrases have been kind of clumped together. Um, there's no capitals other than the, the capital of the I. So it's this seems to me like it's picking out certain features of the voice and giving them this 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 very delicate push in the direction of something that can be read as a poem. And I would say the whole book is a poem. It's not broken up into separate poems. You can read it straight through. But um, notice how the breaks do give you a little bit of the, right, I'm usually somehow shy about reading my young poems. Now, you can't really accept the line breaks as true pauses, right? That would be a little too much. I'm usually somehow shy about reading my young poems. That's too much, right? But if you take them as lighter breaks, I'm usually somehow shy about reading my young poems. You start getting closer to the rhythm of the voice, right? And they do also seem to isolate ideas, right? So because they don't go with this body anymore is a kind of complete thought. And as you see in the third one and the fifth one, he retains the hesitation. So probably I was 23 or maybe 22. And then, so I was 24 or maybe 23, right? This is exactly what Jay was referring to. Retaining part of the way the person speaks in that kind of correcting myself. Now you might ask, why keep that, right? Because this isn't merely a sort of informative report because Joshua was was trying to keep the, the words that Tomaj spoke as he spoke them. And so taking a step back, right, thinking of this as a poem by Joshua, because it is very much a poem by Joshua, but every word here was spoken by Tomaj. Joshua isn't adding words. I don't particularly think he took anything out, although I'm not totally sure about that, but Let's suppose that he tried to stick with, with what he found in, the, in these old tapes that he had that he built this from. I think it's a very interesting challenge because naturally he has a, a pretty minimal toolkit. What he can do is introduce these line breaks and introduce the double breaks and then, of course, upstream from that, there's the other choices I pointed out. For example, the choice to center it on the page, on every page. It goes this way all throughout the book. And the choice to omit the capitals and any punctuation. And we can probably come up with others. Those are the ones I have off the top of my head. So th these are just some observations about this one instance of cap you know, trying to capture this dead friend's voice. And, and also thinking about the fact that they made poems together in collaboration, translating Tomaj's poems. And now Joshua is composing a poem, sort of using the voice of this, this, uh, this now um, absent friend and, and allowing him to speak sort of through this poem. So those are my observations. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Jay. Yeah, I really appreciate this, Alejandro. I do want to add just a couple things. I think using the center of the page, pulling out all the punctu punctuation, having these short lines, right? You mentioned, um, and I'm paraphrasing you, but it draws our attention right to the sayable or to the, 
you know, his, the fact that Tomash is speaking and Josh was trying to sort of really amplify or bring that, keep that to uh, in our sort of um, in the reader's mind. Um, it makes me think that one of the things that we try to do in voice is we want our voice to feel um, to have the texture of consciousness. So when you spoke, um, and that includes the breath and breathing. So when you were talking about keeping the, the hesitations in, you know, I don't remember. No, I started in, in, I started one in 63. So I was 24 or 23. No, no art. I was just a student of art history. Maybe I should start from my youth, from my childhood, if you want. We came, you know, that sort of sense of like, um, starting and starting again, a kind of what I would maybe call a crowded consciousness or a consciousness that keeps having to reorient itself. Um, the fact that we've, that sort of way of being in consciousness or thought that we pull it into the voice seems to create a kind of intimacy. Yeah. So, And that's maybe one of the things that we achieve by bringing the sayable or paying attention to the sayable is that we're really talking about a kind of intimacy between the work and the, and the reader. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I would draw attention to the fact, right. That, that the book's name is, is Tomaj. It's his first name, right? So it's the name that you use when you know him as a friend, not Tomaj Solomon, right. The, the, the author of the poems, um, and it, it 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 it's it pulls you into, I mean that that I think from the title on that choice to have just the first name as the title, and as you can see in the you know in the cover, it's his what I assume is his signature that they used as the the entirety of the book's co uh, cover design. Um, we we included we don't we don't have to look at it right, but but uh, but for comparison, we included here. One of my favorite poems by Tomaj called Good Day Ishtak, um, Iztak. Um, and it it I think it I, I I shared it just to show you just I mean I, Tomaj wrote many, many books and uh, different lengths and kinds of poems. So I don't mean to say this is representative of all of it, but um Tomaj often wrote these what I would call very chatty, talky poems, almost conversational. Um, Good day, he said, a Sonia at home, you loathsome comma, I'll abolish you again, a fat entropy. She is not, I said, she's studying in the library. Do you want to come in? And who are you, Istok? Aha, I heard about you. You hitchhiked to the Polish border, almost froze to death. You have a brother named Yanni. And you write, where can I sit down to be the least bother? You don't bother me at all. And then strange things started to emerge. Da, 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 right. But I think that you can see a little bit. I thought of this one just because you can see an echo of that jumping into the poem and jumping into something conversational. There's obviously multiple people being invoked here. So there's possibly more than one speaker in this poem. But um I think that that Joshua is 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 trying to pick up on what it is in Tomaj's voice that that you can see in a more stylized or formalized way in a poem like this, even though in other ways it's kind of a a loose poem. But um, something about what it was about his voice and his ear that 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 is in this poem also becomes part of this kind of testament book about him. I don't know if you wanted to add anything there, Jay. No, I think that's good. I, I kind of would love to to move into Baby Town just because it's such yeah. a. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Baby Town? Sure. So more more recently, Joshua shared with me this book uh, called Baby Town. This is it hasn't been published yet, but this is a mock up he made, and this is just to show you how what I called the the process that 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 he used to make Tamaj, he uh he redeployed uh in, in, a, in a similar way but very different. So what's Baby Town? Baby Town is a book uh like Tamaj, 
made a, where 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 all of the words are recorded. Um, but here the speakers are his two nephews. And so while Tamaj is a book that that uses recordings of a friend who is now passed, Babytown is his nephews speaking um at a particular point in 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 childhood, right? And how how old were they when they did this? I think um probably like eight or nine, I'm guessing. Um, so uh, uh, let's look at the beginning of Baby Town and, and kind of compare. In Baby Town, a month is a week, a week is a day, a day is a minute, a minute is a second, the second is blah, 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 blah. <laughs> The whole universe. There is a giant honeycomb wall that grows faster than an atom can move. There's actually a unit of time for that. I just forgot what it was. Atom second. Well, that's what it's called in baby town. But there is also a unit of time on Earth. Nutrisecond. No, millisecond. And then basically it grows faster than an atom can move in your body. It separates baby town from monster town. In baby town, we create things and we forget things. So we get things from Earth and tweak them so that we can put them in baby town. And sometimes we forget the things we put in. So like um, we forget. Sometimes we forget planets and sometimes machines and stuff like that. So we have to make up new ones. So baby town is not actually a town. It is basically the whole universe. It is basically 400,000 billion million quadrillion times as big as the sun and it is about a centillion times bigger than our universe. And it keeps getting bigger as we speak because I am making up a bunch of stuff in this interview. So that just makes baby town bigger. Okay, so you can see a bunch of things in common with the way he made Tamaj. We have centered, we, well, it begins with a recording, right? So all the words are here, his nephew's speaking, although you notice that there's two speakers but we don't know who's saying what. So it might be one at a time, or they might be overlapping and interrupting each other. Um, second, we have the same centered text in lowercase. We have those same devices. But if you notice the way that the, um, well, obviously the, the tone is different here. What are we trying to capture? I think he was primarily trying to capture that excited childlike way of, having invented a, a kind of imaginary universe, and now the kids are going to, in a very excited way, report it to you, right? And this is a, this is a slice of their, their imagination. Now, this is kind of anecdotal, but it's, but it's interesting when, <laughs> um, like I said, uh, uh, this book I showed you is, 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 is a mock-up that he made to share with some friends. I think it will probably be published sometime this year. But one of the things Joshua said to me when he first shared this is, I have to hurry up and publish it because they're getting old enough that they're going to be embarrassed by it and not let me do it. So I, I think this is this is this is wonderful, but in, in a way it kind of connects it it, it connects to Tomaj because with, with Tomaj, the impulse to make the book is that his friend was dead and, and he missed him. And so he started listening to these tapes that they had made together. And um, and it made him want to make that into a poem. And here, of course, with Baby Town, the story is not as as sad. His nephews are are, are fine, right? But there is a, a kind of you know more qualified sense of loss, or at least right there, they're getting older, they're getting past the stage, right? They're getting you know as as they enter into their preteen years, they're going to think that this kind of excited babble is uncool. And they don't want to talk about baby town anymore. Baby town was when they were kids, right? But but Joshua has given this, uh, given us the snapshot of their minds um, at that moment, and this kind of amazing, you know, inventive, inventive thing that that kids get into. So that's 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 baby town. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Jay. Um. So I was looking at the chat. Um, I'll just add that one of the 
qualities that I'm seeing of voice in this particular, um, in this, in these poems are repetition. And I've been thinking about, cause the example that I'm going to bring here in a second also uses repetition, but, um, what, you know, what is the use of repetition in terms of vocality? Like what, like when we're speaking, why do we continue to repeat ourselves? And I, I actually think it's, it's kind of an, it's ori it's like an orienting space, you know, that we, that if, if voice includes the texture of consciousness and thought, which is wandering and digressive and kind of crowded, um, that repetition serves to kind of come back or orient ourselves as we then sort of extend off. And so I was thinking about just, you know, the, 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 the baby town, essentially, as the sort of space they continue to come back to. Um, you know, it grows faster than an atom can move in your body. It separates baby town from monster town, you know, in baby town. So that sense of repetition sort of, you know, keeps the voice rooted or directional as it also then sort of wanders off and becomes, you know, and gets lost in, in other sorts of, of, of streams or qualities of streams. Um, and also we're, you know, we're, we're taking that quality and, and making a book out of it. I mean, that's, that's the thing is like, this is, this is, um, with, with Tomaj, you know, it's not, obviously it's more common to find a book of, let's say interviews with a poet, you know, there may be other examples of, of, of something close to what Joshua did with, with Tomaj, but here we have, you know, capturing the speech of, of kids and making a whole book of, you know, basically just nudging it in the direction of, 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 of a poem, uh, and of a book made up of a series of poems that is something i think much more much more surprising and challenging right which is also why you find things like billion million quadrillion right uh, all those kinds of things that that come readily to speech especially to the child's speech but aren't you know they're, they're not the kinds of things that one would usually put into a, a poem yeah, so there's some good comments here too. I wanted to note in the chat, um, really good conversation. I'm not going to read all of it, but just Roz, I like what you said about the ephemeral improvise, like the improvise in ephemeral home. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you for that. And that people are also picking up on childlike wonder, right? Like that's a quality. It's a feeling. Um, but it is part of voice. It modulates voice or sharpens voice. Um, voice ascends, I think, through through wonder. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We'll go a little over, Alejandro. How do you, <laughs> excuse me. Um, what do you think about um, spending some time with this Dion Brand piece? How does that feel to you? Sure, go ahead. Um, okay, so, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, 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 actually, Okay, I kind of changed my mind. I'm sorry. I just because these are your translations, I would really how do you feel about us talking about Porchia? Oh, sure. I actually uh, prefer that. Do you want to talk a little bit about Porchia? Yeah, let me grab the, let me grab the book. So this is this is a long-term project for me. I actually started working on this right after I finished uh, Micrograms, which was actually a collaboration with, with Joshua uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, this is a book, uh, uh, you can see there, uh, Voices. This is the Spanish Voces. And um, the, the way that it looks is um, like this. Right, so the Voces are these two or three line short and then here's the question what are they are they poems are they aphorisms are they little snippets of prose um what's interesting of that is that Portia seems to have thought of voices voices as a 
as a genre unto itself. So they are, one way to understand that is that he meant it like sayings, like when we say, it, you know, the a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush is a saying. Um, but of course, Every most of the things that we call sayings, maybe all of them, are are inherited, right? They're part of oral tradition, folk tradition, um, and maybe in a sideways way they they enter into literature. So he was kind of composing these new ones that would work that way. So I'll read a couple of them to you. Placed here, in some faraway nebula, I do what I do, so that the universal balance of which I am a part does not go off balance. One who has seen everything empty itself out almost knows what everything fills itself with. Before wandering on my path, I was my path. I found all of my first world in my scarce bread. My father, in his departure, gave half a century to my childhood. Smallnesses are the eternal and everything else, all of it, the brief, the very brief. Without that dumb vanity of showing ourselves, which is in everyone and everything, we would see nothing and nothing would exist. Truth has very few friends and the very few friends that it has are suicides. Treat me as you ought to treat me, not as I deserve to be treated. Man does not go anywhere. It all comes to man like tomorrow. Um, let's see, there was a question about the numbering. Um, the numbering is is actually uh, that's that's just me uh, for the sake of my translation process and discussing it with people. There's no numbers in the in the Spanish. Um, I was it just is if I'm you know for my own process and for discussing it with people, it's a little easier to say number twelve than to remember each one. So the the main thing when you observe what's going on in these is that some of them do very much have this sort of structure of they, they sound like a saying look at number 17 here what is bad about not believing is believing a little this could almost be like a thing that you heard from somebody um but when you look at one like 19 i come from dying not from being born i am leaving being born they're the use of the first person brings it closer to the space i think of a poem um it's it's th this there's a distinct person or voice that's saying this um whether the eye is the same eye throughout the book is kind of an open question uh similarly number 20 my god i've almost never believed in you but i've always loved you hmm. Or 21, if I were like a rock and not like a cloud, my thinking, which is like wind, would leave me. So in in these, I think that the, the questions that we were thinking about with Joshua's works are shifted in, in a different direction. This is where this matter of the, the sayable comes in. So... I I I do think that especially with the preponderance of the I, even though most of these are rather abstract, there is there is the sense that there is a distinct voice that's each one is a voice and is being spoken. But also, um, as I read about Porchia, I learned that he would sometimes say these to people. Um he wasn't, you know, part of a, a literary community of the sort where you could imagine him having, you know, given a reading of the voices. That wouldn't have happened. But it does seem from anecdotes that if you would go over to his house, you know, he would uh, offer you an apple. And then uh, there would be a, like a moment of silence and then he would just say one of these. And also sometimes 
in in not just informal moments, but you know, there's a story about him uh, running into a friend in the street, and his friend was coming back from the hospital and was very distressed because uh, uh, you know a relative was was very ill, and and he had one of these ready to say, and he said it with great weight. He didn't say, uh, you know, let me read you a poem or let me share you something I wrote. But this is something he had available to say to them. And so uh, this sort of goes into one of the things that I tried to retain when I translated it is I wanted these to be sayable in English. This goes back to the earlier conversation about uh, what it means to say them out loud and what it means to read a translation out loud to someone else to, to sort of access the, the space of the English only um, ear. I wanted I wanted these to to uh, be in a kind of vernacular, right? So to to get into a space where they sounded too philosophical, too wise man speaking would be wrong. Somebody, you know, you had to imagine a poor immigrant in Argentina being able to say this to his friend, and whatever the analog of that is here for us, it had to work. So. That's that's uh this is an ongoing project. I don't know if I'll ever finish it. <laughs> I have I've been, you know, picking this up and putting it down for for a long time. Um Hey Alejandro, uh, can can yes. I ask you a quick question about them? Mm -hmm. Um if and if this occurred to you as you were uh as, as you translate them. Um definitely there seems to be a kind of um and I mentioned this before when we were talking like he sort of works in either like twos or three beats. Um, there's a sense that he's reaching that, that that his sort of thinking or his speaking is always speaking towards contradiction, um, that it's chasing or wandering towards contradiction. Um, but the voice is also really like, um, maybe for lack of a better word, like compressed, like pared down. Um, I don't know if any of those um, resonate with you or that sense, the beat. I'm curious if you have a sense about like the twos and the threes that kind of come out. Yeah. And I, I think that is, um, you know, to refer back to these inherited sayings, like I was, you know, I gave the example of a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. First of all, the saying has a, it, it is like a, you know, my, I don't, I don't quite know how it would scan in terms of meter, right? But it has a, a, a simple, kind of song-like structure, da 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 da, da right? And and that breaks into two halves, right? And also you have the one and the two, mm. laid out in the two halves, right? And so a lot of times it seems like, you know, let's look at eighteen. I know you have nothing. That's why I ask you for everything so that you have everything. So two periods and each of the phrases is the same length, right? So there's a simple triadic structure and then nothing, everything, everything, except that the by the time you get to the third everything, you've kind of jumped up a level of abstraction and now there's something else that's happening. Why? Because I know you have nothing. That's why I ask you for everything, just direct contradiction, so that you have everything is what? Something beyond that. Yes. Now this is this is this is this is more at the level of of ethical, right? You have nothing, but I ask you for everything. And because of my demand, because of my insistence, you now have what I'm asking you for. So you don't have nothing. So we're back, we're back at the beginning, right? Or look at 19. I come from dying, not from being born. I am leaving being born. This one is a little harder to parse out, but you still have the, uh, the same here, which is not two periods, it's a comma and a period. So the two thoughts are linked together. Um, but it, it does seem to try to be an effort to somehow reverse the polarity of, of birth and death. Mm -hmm.
And instead of thinking of death as a death as the exit, birth as the exit. Um, look at the number 20. My God, I've almost never believed in you, but I have always loved you. Mm. Here you can you can you can look at this and think about it as there's a there's two commas, and what's between the two commas is a is a parenthesis or a break that turns it inside out, right? So if you took that out, my God, I've always loved you. Mm. You know, fine. I mean, we might all feel that way, but it's not an exceptional or remarkable thing. My God, I have almost never believed in you, but I've always loved you. So now that almost never believe changes the meaning of the always loved and maybe changes the meaning of God, right? Mm. So a lot of them have this. I, I found a very interesting comparison and in, uh, uh, someone uh, said what Porchia does in his voices is a little bit like what M.C. Escher does in the visual, uh, right? Right. There's there's a ladder that goes up and then it comes down and then it goes up and it comes down, but the up and the down are the same, right? Or there's a hand drawing a hand that's drawing a hand, right? A lot of times they, they seem to have the, the, this kind of looping, right? And so, yeah, to think about this in terms of voice again, it's not so much the kind of grain of everyday speech we're talking about here, not in the sense of the you know, the, the the sort of interruption or spontaneous energy that we are seeing with Joshua's nephews or the particular way that, that Tamar speaks. This is more like, I think, the the anonymous voice, the voice of tradition, the, 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 the folk voice, if you want to talk about it that way, or the voice of the people, insofar as it exists in these sayings and has already been kind of uh, somehow calcified or formalized in the sayings, but now taking that and saying, I'm going to make that my form. I'm going to write directly into that and write things that that will be said that way. Yeah, I mean, the other, that's a, these are amazing. Alejandro, by the way, I just want to thank you for sharing them and sharing this work. It's like a real um, gift to honestly, to to receive this, to receive these pieces um, just for the residency. Um, I was also thinking about, you know, it's it's sort of this, it is kind of this folk language. It is um, voices, many voices. It is um, Porchia wanting to really create instances of sayable. Um, and yet they do, when you're thinking about the Escher part, you're really like to me that's that's also the texture of consciousness the mind right it's the mind that is turning in on itself and turning beyond itself and so these pieces also have that that sort of level of of consciousness and um and there's in for me there's intimacy there right we we walk around in our days not being able to see in one another's thoughts. And one of the things that, you know, language or, you know, literature gives us is it gives us these sort of glimpse into another being's consciousness. And so there's sort of suddenly this sort of connection that before, um, before it was just sort of separation or loneliness, and we are suddenly being connected with not just a person, but with what they're thinking, with what is kind of happening within them. Um, yeah, I guess what I would add to that is just to, to to notice that, you know, if we were just to compare the two sets of examples, I think the success of, of Joshua's works that we are looking at has to do with retaining something very spontaneous about the individual's voice. And, and 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 allowing that to be in the poem, even when there's elements that are surprising to us, like the 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 self interruptions in Tamaj or the the kind of funny you know made up words like centillion and the kids, right? Whereas whereas here it's it's more this kind of like crystallized formalized element, right? Which 
it may or may not. I mean, the funny thing about these sayings I was talking about, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I don't know why I picked up on that one, because that's actually not one I ever use. <laughs> But uh, if, if I think of, if I think of ones that that I that I, I I do like or use more, like one of my favorite sayings is uh, "play stupid games, win stupid prizes." Um, and uh, if I just went around saying that all the time, it would be it, it's it, you know it, there's something about timing with these, right? If if you say it at the right moment, then uh, it it it's kind of the 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 right word um so the the sayable i think has to do with this right word i don't see jay anymore has he vanished i don't know what this means maybe maybe his laptop ran out of juice well okay um let me uh well we're hopefully he will reconnect uh let's see about the uh the chat. So Raz was asking, why would you not call them aphorisms? Why would you not call them poems? Is it because of the folk tradition quality? Well, I have a I have a a straightforward answer and then maybe a more you know developed answer. The straightforward answer is that what he called them was voices. It's not just the title of the book. Each one of these, the units for him are voices. He didn't call them poems or aphorisms. So that's the um that's the answer okay jay's texting me saying he got booted yikes um now at a at a at a at a kind of more if we try to get behind that why why did why did he choose this um i i don't think there's some you know kind of rule book here preventing us from dealing with them as aphorisms or as poems but i think the 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 question is you know partly about when we try to get behind that choice of his to say these are voices we we sort of i mean it's like a little bit like um thinking that for him voice was a genre like sonnet is a genre and it would be peculiar not to accept that a sonnet is a sonnet right so if we look at it and we say well these look like little prose poems we wouldn't necessarily be missing everything, but we might be missing some of some of the features. So that's all. I mean, it's not it's nothing that we have to be, you know, dogmatic about. It's more about being receptive. And, and like I said, you know, these these anecdotes that I picked up on reading about him, like that he would actually say them to people, um, sometimes informally uh, and sometimes in, in moments of high emotion suggests that he thought of them having a particular use or function it would be a little odd you know to find your friend distraught on the street and say let me tell you my you know my favorite aphorism from so and so philosopher okay so jay says our building's network is off and it's up to me to wrap up okay well, I think we've gone through the examples we wanted to go through so maybe to wrap up let's just see if folks have we can take a minute or two, see if folks have questions or comments here. Um, I think we're a little bit over time as it is, but let's take a minute to see uh, either through the chat or if you want to turn your mic on here for a minute. And you just you said uh, voice as a genre. I thought that was pretty interesting. I never really thought of voice as a genre before. Well, it's that's how I understand what he meant by calling them voices, right? And 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 it's not so much. I mean, a sonnet's genres. No, they're more like a form, right? It's a poetic form. So I, 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 maybe the better way to put it is it's a form to write into, right? And we could look at the book and, and think about what features do these have? So for example, some of them use the first person, some don't. Some, some do sound like sayings and some sound more like 
I, I mean, sayings in the the proverb sense, and some of them sound more like um, things that someone said or that someone could say. Um, there's a, 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 a curious story about this too. Um, so he uh, he he wasn't able to. He he had a bunch of these books printed up but he couldn't really sell them or distribute them. So there was a whole kind of pile in his house and he was, he was tired of this. So he donated them all to these uh, rural community libraries. They were sent all to the, he lived in Buenos Aires in the capital of Argentina. They were sent to all the, all these libraries in the provinces that were usually set up in very poor districts, you know, so people could learn to read and educate themselves. And so the 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 books had this whole this whole sort of life there, and there's stories about uh, people finding them and liking them so much that they they made a copy. Of course, this was before photocopiers, so the way that you made a copy was to hand retype the whole thing, and then these would get stapled together and circulate. And um, there and and because they were stapled together, you know, sometimes you you kind of lose the first couple of pages. And so there's there's versions of this that people had that don't have his name. And the sayings just kind of circulated on their own. And again, people that have, have looked into this have found instances of people doing something like, you know, uh, spray painting one of these on a wall or writing it to somebody in a, in a you know, a, a, a gift card, a thank you card or a birthday card or something like this, a holiday card. And uh, and not even knowing that that the saying had an author, right? So in some sense, that's a mark of the success that even separated from his, you know, his name being on the cover, they sort of circulated um, and were able to sort of return to that the kind of anonymous space. The same way we don't know who who said a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I mean that. That could be from some poem somewhere or something. A lot of times you look into this thing and it turns out it's a line in Shakespeare or something. But but a lot of these are also, you know, truly anonymous. Um, let's see, I'm looking at Asilas. I'm not sure if it's already said, but voice is like an added layer to the piece that seemed visible, but not many people realize how important it is. Um not sure if that makes sense yeah i think i can see the direction you're starting to go but i think that the if i'm understanding what you mean by voice as an added layer i guess i would just go in this direction that it, as you know as the book in terms of this you know here's one here's another here's another here's another you can certainly go through and read them and ask yourself, like, what did this man think? Like, why why did he say this and then that? Why are they in this order? And, the, you know, you can do that because he did he did write them and he did make the book. But there's also this other thing that they have this, like I was just telling, they, they had this capacity and we know, I mean, there's proof that they could exist independently of the form of the book and return to being sayings. They could return, you know, by by the time that somebody is uh, spray painting one on a wall, th there's something else happening than the publication of a book. Um, and so that potential, just like at the very beginning of the exchange, Jay and I were talking about what happens when you read something out loud. There's also this this idea of the, you know, the the sort of writing something that has that other mode of publicity, at least as a possibility. And then the question is, who who's going to do that right because the it it you could write with that intention but other people have to step in and participate and do their part right in the same way that if we think about Joshua's books um Tamaj or his nephews didn't say the things they said in the recording so that they could publish right if someone else in this case Joshua picked up the words and say okay let's make this a poem and it becomes, in, in a sense, a collaboration, you know, well, with Tamaj, you know, over decades, right, of the original conversation that was recorded into the poem with his nephews, you know, less years, but but similarly. And I think with Porchia, there was this sense that if if what he did with the voices was successful, 
that they would just circulate anonymously, that some of them would pick up and have, have a life of their own. All right, you all, I think it's a good time to wrap up. Um, uh, sorry about that last minute uh, glitch with Jay, but I think we got through through all of it. Um, let's see, we have one last comment here from Linda. I want to recommend to everyone an opportunity to volunteer to transcribe the life story of an incarcerated person from their handwritten manuscript. And here's a link. I was surprised to find these questions of voice arising, even going from handwriting to typewriting. Yeah, very important. Okay, so uh, while I'm while I'm wrapping up, uh, grab that link there from the chat if you're interested in this. But anyway, yeah, I hope this was useful. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking with folks in my workshop a little more, and and hopefully you can all take the conversation that the ones that aren't in Jay and I's workshop can take it into yours. Okay, thanks everybody.